Good morning. I want to start off today by telling you a little story about uh, something that happened to Mr. Rogers. I don't know if you know this, but Fred Rogers was actually an ordained Presbyterian minister. Um, and he had this occasion once to be in church with a friend of his, and he's sitting through the sermon and he's thinking in his head, wow, well, I just like this guy's boring. I'm not really enjoying this. And uh, he turns to his neighbor, to his friend to say, hey, could we, you know, skip out during the final hymn? And he turns to his friend and his friend has tears coming down his face. And he realized, he said, that he had gone to church to judge and his friend had gone to receive. And I love that so much. It's always a good reminder that not everything always resonates in a worship service with all of us all the time. You know, it may be one thing, maybe the music, maybe opening words, maybe a sermon, maybe a reading. But if we can come to worship, like take a deep breath and get ourselves in that space of being intentional about this hour that we're going to share with one another. We get to that place of being able to receive. Welcome to our celebration of life. It's so good to be together with all of you today. I can't wait to explain more in the sermon. About two years ago now, I got one of those calls, kind of the call where someone tells you, uh, you need to sit down. I was standing up, so I sat down. And on the other end of the line, I heard Max is dead. Max was 27. Max was the only child of one of my closest friends. He was truly a remarkable young man. And in middle school and high school, I actually spent a lot of time with this kid because he was on uh, Planned Parenthood's national youth board and we did a lot of work around reproductive health and sex ed and suffice it to say that news laid me flat had me staring out of windows feeling empty and as my friend said she was left inconsolable that's kind of how I felt so that happened around this time, two years ago, and then I did Max's memorial in Rochester, New York in December. I connected daily with my friend about all the aspects that go into taking care of a memorial service, what to say, how to say it, when to say it, with what tone, in what manner, ultimately how best to celebrate, honestly, this remarkable young man's life. Writing a eulogy, a service, of remembrance is at its best, kind of telling the story of someone's life and trying to really tweak out what the meaning is of that life and help those who mourn hold on to something true and bright. Something about who they were that can live on in others, a means to hold and to have that person, something that takes that person and integrates it then into your own life. And as I was going through, kind of thinking through how to explain some of Max's life and writing and mourning and writing and mourning, I came across this reading by Reverend Dick Gilbert. And it actually made me think about the living more than the dying for those who have passed. It's called Celebrate the Interval. And here it is. Life is a brief interval between birth and death. It is composed of a few notes between prelude and postlude. It is a drama quickly played between the rising and falling of a curtain. What shall we do at that interval of time? What combination of notes shall we play? The brevity of day is full of pain. Discordant notes reverberant in the soul. The end of the play is ever in doubt. Why then are we so careless with our time? Why do we not sound the music of our hearts? Is it not time to play our own melody? Life is a brief interval between birth and death. 
May we celebrate that interval with joy. May we sing the song belonging to us. May we act as though our very life depended on it because it does. Here's what struck me. May we sing the song belonging to us, right? Max had his own song he was working on and it got shut, cut short in that second movement. When working on Max's memorial and reading Dick's piece, something shifted in me a bit. It was both small and grand, if that makes any sense at all. It is often said that ministers have about five sermons in us that we kind of repeat over and over again. And as much as I like kind of rail against that, some of that is true, right? Like themes that certain pieces always come out with individual ministers. So while I rail against that, I, you know, honestly, it, it is kind of true. But something happened when I was working on Max's memorial. I had a little shift and it was this. I started having a great deal of empathy for the living. Yeah, empathy. Mainly because over the years, I've watched way too many people get stuck on the same note or stuck in one movement of their life or just when they had a crescendo and a flourishing in their life in one movement, just when they had that crescendo, they start a decrescendo, not of their own making and sometimes of their own making. And I know that I've got stuck myself more often than I ever want to admit. And it's infuriating, actually, because I know the song that belongs to me. And yet I can get waylaid, sometimes immobilized on one note. There are a lot of reasons for that. But today I want to touch on two of them that I think contribute to the derailment of our living into the song that belongs to each of us. The song that belongs only to you. Reminders of sorts to carry with you. The first reminder is from a friend of mine who is Korean and she was adopted by a white family here in the United States. And I'm not gonna use my friend's real name but we're gonna call her Lynn as I explain this story. So one day when I was hanging out with Lynn, she started talking to me about uh, the stories that she was told growing up and the ones we know to be true as they kind of shape who we are as we grow up into the world. And the story that Lynn was told actually about her adoption from Korea was this, that she was brought to an orphanage in a beautiful little basket and she had a very clean onesie on, and she had a tag that was um, kind of like a little note that was pinned to her onesie, and it says, please help take care of our family. We're very poor, and you can make a difference to our child. So that's what the story was, like that basket showed up at the adoption agency in Korea. It's a sweet story, right? a story of concern and care. Now, Lynn said she always believed this story that her parents had told her. And it was a nice story to hold on to, to start yourself out in the world. Lynn said she never questioned that story until she went to college. Now, I should also say that as she's telling me this, she's showing me like burn marks on the bottom part of her arm and on the back of her legs. So when Lynn went to college, she took a lot of international women's studies courses. And in one of those courses, she discovered that in Korea, China, and Russia, they sent tons of female babies to the United States in the 1980s. And Lynn realized that her story may not have been so rosy because none of the stories that she was hearing were rosy. I mean, like none of them. It occurred to Lynn that there was a good chance, actually, that the burn marks that scarred her skin were not by accident, but intentional, and that, in fact, she was a neglected child, not a loved one, before she was adopted. I want you to fast forward a couple of years, and it turns out Lynn had a co-worker whose niece was about the exact same age of 
Lynn and this niece of her coworker had gone to Korea to find out more about her birth family and uh, figure out more about her birth parents, right? When she got to the adoption agency, she was told the exact same story that Lynn was told down to the basket, the onesie, the exact same language on that little note that was pinned to her, uh, her onesie. And when my friend heard that, she said that mythical origin or origin story was shattered immediately for her. The likelihood that her burn marks were accidental and that the story her parents told her went right out the window. She came to terms with the fact that she was probably left to die somewhere like garbage in a field or in a trash can or in the street, exactly as she had bore witness to in her women's studies courses. She says her parents probably also knew this too, but they liked believing in the story and they wanted her to believe it as well. And I can understand that from a parent's point of view. It's a compassionate thing to do as parents to tell your child that sweet story. But when Lynn told her parents that story, the real story, they did not want to alter the original storyline. Or as she said, maybe they couldn't, they needed to hold on to that myth. As for my friend, she's grateful for the truth. It's changed her own perception of herself or who she knew herself to be at her core. Perhaps the better way of saying it is it solidified who she knew herself to be. Someone who is resilient and flexible and strong. She said her desire to leave the world a better place has always felt like it came from someplace deep, like in her unconscious, in her bones, as if she knew, you know, like right away that her life's work was to engage in social justice work. And she has always done that. It's been very personal for her. It's like foundational to who she is. So here's the thing, my friend Lynn's story isn't just going back, right? And revising the story that was told to her, making the story more tender through forgiveness or understanding through like reframing it. My friend in effect became though that fulcrum, the hinge that sets the story on a new path. She changed the tempo of her song, moved it to a new key cut through the dissonance that was brewing in the background and got real about her song. Lynn is not a person who says, I was an abused, abandoned, unwanted child. As an adult, she's saying, I am a person who can look at my very dark past and realize that is my story, but it's not me. It is not me. I tell this to you because I think so many of us have dark paths, right? Having things done to us, tragedies that befall us, or we've participated in our own demise, our own colossal missteps, and we end up describing our stories through lenses that identify primarily with that tragedy. Victim, abandoned, abused, survivor, addicted, neglected, unwanted, unloved. But our dark past isn't us. It's part of our story. Your story, friends, can be written in a way that empowers you to own something about your life and actually move on. You are not identified by a dark past that happened to you. You are you. So shape the story so that it reminds you that you've garnered strength and insight from it, but that you are not a product of it. And if you haven't yet garnered strength and insight from it, make it so, shape the story moving forward. Look at that dark, gloomy past and face it squarely. Come to terms with it. So you control it, not it, you. I love how one journalist puts this. The difference actually between despair and hope 
is just a different way of telling stories from the same set of facts. I'm going to say that again. The difference between despair and hope is just a different way of telling stories from the same set of facts. <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay, so the second reminder about how we can get derailed from living into our song and how we can get back. We are usually actually much harsher narrators of our own stories than how others tell our stories. I know you be, may be thinking that your story kind of unfolds as you go along, but in reality, it seems to me we are constantly writing the story. As one author puts it, we have memories of the past, of our history, and every day actually finds us weaving a story about who we are, where we are going, and why events happened as they did. And many of us are strikingly hard narrators of these life stories. We hint to ourselves that we've been morons from the very beginning. Truth is, we mess up a lot as humans. We just do. One of my favorite lines from the pop singer, country singer, Taylor Swift, is this. Once upon a time, a few mistakes ago, I was in your sight, you got me alone. I love that little quip, right? A few mistakes ago, da -da, da -da, da -da, right? Not the last time I made a mistake, but a few mistakes ago. We make mistakes often, and some of us with a plum, well, all of us with a plum at one time or another. But hey, life can be meaningful, great even, with a lot of failure and humiliation. I love how this little video by the School of Life puts it. Mistakes don't have to be absurd. They can be signs of how little information we have on which to base the most consequential decisions on. Messing up isn't a sign of evil, it's evidence of what we're up against. Not all of the disasters are wasted anyway. Maybe we spent a decade not quite knowing what we wanted to do with ourselves professionally. Maybe we went through a success of failed relationships that left us confused and hurt a lot of people. But these experiences weren't meaningless because they were necessary to later development and maturity. We needed a crisis at work to understand our work identities. We had to fail at love to fathom our hearts. No one gets anywhere important at just one go. We have to forgive ourselves the horrors of our first draft. So good storytellers recognize, contrary to certain impressions, that the central character of the story isn't always responsible for every disaster or triumph. Now, there is a lot to unpack in there, really. But I think what rings most true for me is we have to forgive ourselves the horrors of our first draft. We have to forgive ourselves the horrors of our first draft the first marriage that failed, or even the second for that matter. The unfulfilled dreams of being an activist or an artist or a parent. The career that ended in shambles because of a bad temper or a lack of know-how or a defensiveness on our part. Errors and missteps and reaching beyond our introvertedness to finally connect, or the foibles of our extrovertedness that keep us from listening effectively to others. The relationship with a friend or colleague that ended poorly because of a lack of compromise or a difference in values. The frustrated dreams of never living abroad or maybe joining the Peace Corps. The schooling that fell through because of a lack of a frontal lobe being fully developed or lack of ambition or motivation or funding. Now, some of those are ours to own, right? That's always true. And others are due to circumstances beyond our control. The economy, your parents, the government, your enemies. Truth is, usually, okay, almost always, it's not just us that messes up. 
It's a combination of outside forces and us. It's both, right? Except often when we look back at our first drafts, well, it's only us. At least that's what we tell ourselves. And here's the problem. I have right, <laughs> ah, I have yet to write anything in my first draft that's good. It takes revisions and edits and cuts and consideration and reevaluating better writing. Life is that. At first, it's a first draft. But well, we hope we get better at it as we go along. And friends, in writing these stories, your story, your song, don't let the first draft be your end draft. Become a better lyricist. Learn from the mistakes of the draft and grow. Change that story. One of the reasons we end up, I think, just looking at that first draft and then getting stuck is because we look around at the rest of the people in our lives, our friends, our colleagues, our other parishioners, our neighbors, our leaders, and we see what is on the surface is kind of bright and shiny and glowing in the sun. But what if I told you what you think is bright and shiny is most often, well, certainly not the entire story. I am a humanist at my heart. And uh, my husband and I also, who is a, a Unitarian Universalist minister, talk about human beings as being the four F's. And you're gonna to have to forgive me a little bit here. But the four F's are human beings are fragile, flawed, effed up, and fabulous. I've been thinking my job as a minister is to help people live into that fabulous part of their humanhood, right? But to also just accept we are the other three F's as well, all of us. No one is really exempt. I've come to see my work as a pastor to help all of us think of the world out there as one big ocean, actually. And we look out at our neighbors and our friends and our colleagues and acquaintances, and we see their lives, other people's lives, shining icebergs, like above the waterline, right? And it's beautiful and reflective. My job it's to lower the water for all of you to see how massive that iceberg is. How we don't see the majority of people's lives, even when we think we do. We don't see that which is covered in water, the bulk of that iceberg that resides in the pitch black of the water. So to lower the water line means we get a glimpse into that human condition that we are all fragile, flawed, and fabulous too. Today, I'm lowering that waterline for you. So you can see that you are no different than the next person in the seat sitting next to you right now. You may think your mistakes are unique to you, only yours to have and hold, but you're not that special. And I don't mean that really sarcastically. I mean that like honestly, clearly as like a, a point of fact. Question is, how do you not get tripped up in your first draft given the fact that first drafts for the most part are kind of crap? Well, first, forgive yourself and others. And to forgive yourself doesn't mean that you forget, right? but it means you release yourself and others from a time and place that has you stuck. Self-forgiveness is essential. And then move on. I know of an art teacher who, when you made a mistake, they said, huh, so you made a mistake. Make it beautiful now. Not to erase it or gloss over it or paint over it or scratch it out but make it beautiful. That's what we can all do with our mistakes, make them beautiful. A colleague, David Blanchard, wrote this great piece called Listening to Your Song, and uh, he wrote this. On sabbatical in East Africa, I heard a story of people who believe that we are each created with our own song. Their tradition as a community is to honor that song by singing it as a welcome when a child is born, as a comfort when the child is ill, in celebration when they 
Mary and an affirmation in love when death comes. Most of us were not welcomed into the world that way. Few of us seem to even know our song, he writes. I love the idea that each of us have our own song that we are born with. And then while we go about singing it back to us when we need it, perhaps that what that is kind of what my colleague Dick is getting at, the song that belongs to us, right? The song that whether we acknowledge it or not, get ourselves stuck in singing all the time, only the first verse of. We don't let that song turn into a symphony with different movements and tempos and keys because we don't, well, sometimes believe we can expand it. But we can, and we should. So here's the thing about doing Max's memorial and spending the last two years being present with my friend who reminds herself each day, by the way, about her own precious living now in ways that she never did before. So I've decided I need to ask you a favor. It's this. I'm asking you to not get stuck in the second movement of your song, not because of death, but because you make it so. Most of us actually are onto the third and fourth movement of our song in reality, and yet still singing the song of the first or second movement, our first drafts. And I, friends, am imploring you today, please don't become the dead amongst the living. Resist that. Let's all help each other resist that. And in so doing, let's open up our songs. Let's make them a symphony. Or to put all of that another way, let's live between the intervals. Death will far too soon take all of us. And it's a tragedy of a different kind if we don't really sing our songs in all their color and keys and majesty. So sing your song, friends, fully today and from this day forward. Maybe so.